Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Well, we're back to the whiteboard today, and as the title says, we're going to be talking all about banks, debt, and money. Now, it's very busy on the whiteboard today. There's a lot happening in the economy, but I'm going to walk you all through it, and there's some really basic takeaways that I want to get out of today to understand what is going on at the moment and how the battle for money, who's in control, has really changed over the years. And digital finance, and particularly cryptocurrency, is the ultimate disruptor of where we're going in the future. So let's start off. The whiteboard is basically divided into two halves, and we've got the real economy and the financial economy. Now, in the past, this was a small, small segment of the economy, basically with just the banks when we had to get a loan to start a business in the real world. So over here in the real world, we've got the government. They sit at the top there. Uh, and this other line that we've got that you'll see here is just uh, internationally or globally. So beneath this line, we've just got the local economy to keep things simple. But obviously overseas, we have trade and other governments overseas, but we also have the world of finance, which is now really global. And these are where uh, the lines have blurred between the global markets and the local markets. And we're going to get into what central banks are doing, uh, what other governments, what other banks are doing, um, that, you know, the, the blur between those markets and how you get from the local economy and into the financial markets as well. Those gateways have really just opened up and that does transfer risk and inflation and other things which we'll get into as well. But basically in the real economy, we've got Average Joe here, other citizens, they're working, and the first thing to understand is the velocity of money. That's something we've spoken about a lot on the channel, and when people are going out and starting businesses, employing more people, getting more jobs, they're going out to spend their money at another business. Um, they're going to hire somewhere, so let's say that's commercial real estate, a big building in the city. Uh, their business is growing. They're going to buy another house. So this is where money flows through the economy there, and the rate that it's doing that is the velocity of money. And the problem that we're seeing these days is the velocity of money has just really fallen. So the people aren't really spending. A lot of people don't have money to spend, so they've basically got no savings or they're in debt. So they're trying to pay down debt rather than spending money and increasing what's flowing around in the economy. And then we've got the government sector up here. So we have you know your schools, hospitals, the wider healthcare system. Um, that's all looked after and paid for by the government, which we're going to get to, as well as infrastructure. So in theory, if we've got more bridges and, and roads, better healthcare services and a really healthy population, we're going to have more people that are able to participate uh, in the workforce. And if everyone's healthy, it's going to have a lot less costs for government, but we're going to get into why that's changing because of the corporate world uh, as well. Now, every country has some sort of resources, um, basics that people want, you know, your food and water. Some countries like Australia have got a lot of resources and commodities. And from those, we want to start businesses like farms or mines, sort of primary, primary industries. Uh, we can trade between those businesses and they can start smaller businesses uh, and that can lead to bigger businesses in turn. And then these days, the modern world, we've got these markets where so many people uh, have gone this, this route where you're listing companies. So we've got big publicly traded companies, uh, private companies, so you can still have shares in your company uh, and even be traded on some markets, sort of secondary markets behind closed doors, rather than the actual uh, stock market where we have all these different um, assets, products, and particularly derivatives, which we're going to get into later as well, where they're all traded. Now, from those products, we have investment funds, hedge funds, pension funds, uh, there's a relationship there where obviously sometimes they want to invest in the real economy and buy out real estate or businesses, but they're also paying out. So a lot of these businesses or individuals, nearly all of them these days will have a bank account. And you might think, well, yeah, of course, but if you go back a few years when you know our parents got paid in cash in an envelope at work, so you actually could run a business and have an individual that didn't have a bank account. 
And a lot of people just take that for granted these days and we're moving towards this place where everyone wants to bank cash. But what that does is concentrate the power with banks. Now, if governments or banks or central banks start to launch these digital currencies and these ledgers where they can monitor everything, that's another story altogether. But it's just an important point to think about that the cash economy actually can require or enable someone, and this still happens overseas in other less developed countries, where they don't have these bank accounts yet. And that's all going to change. And the big point we're going to finish with today is about how powerful tools like smartphones and cryptocurrencies are really going to disrupt all of this. So that's the, the basics of our little local economy. Now, we've got governments that are trying to balance their scales there with how much they spend because that's money out according to them. That's a negative and they can only get money from a couple of mechanisms, can't they? So people are paying tax and, and businesses. Now, some businesses are trying to you know, set up overseas and we've got these uh, offshore accounts, trusts and shell companies and this can become a headache for the overseas governments and banks as well because nobody really knows who is where and who's paying tax where. But, you know, keep it simple. In theory, we've got government that can get tax from individuals and, and businesses or they can sell bonds. Now, the market, like, the market has a big appetite for these because they're considered safe. If we think about an Australian bond or a you know, US government bond, they're the most in demand in the world because they're always going to pay you back compared to a company that has more risk or an overseas government. People aren't that willing to lend to the Argentinian or Venezuelan government at the moment. So if you've got a decent economy, you can get an okay yield. This is where people say, you know what? I'm always going to get paid back. Maybe the dollars that I'm getting paid back in are slightly less valuable because of how much money is being printed, which we're going to get into. But there's a big demand from everyone, from individual retail investors can even buy a government bond, but particularly the big funds, uh, the banks, and even the Fed in their normal open market operations, day-to-day -day activities, they do buy government bonds, and that's a way that they can give money to the government. Now, when we get into things like QE and the, the ramping up of money printing, this is where they print excess money and tell the government to issue extra bonds and they will come in and buy them all. So you might hear things like the Fed have monetized all the government's debt so far this year, or the Fed now own 30% of all government bonds. In Japan, their central bank, they basically own all of the government bonds because there's just so much money being printed and better places to invest that the market isn't really interested in owning Japanese government, uh, government bonds. Now, those, some of those other central banks are really starting to intervene in markets, which we're going to get into what the Fed has started doing recently as well. But that's the basics of how the bond market works. Now, in America, at the moment, they've got $26, $27 trillion in debt. Uh, in Europe, a lot of these countries are being told that they've got too much debt. You've got to undergo austerity. So Italy, Greece, you know, spend less or tax more, but you've got to start to balance these scales. And the problem here in lies, which is what Steve Keen often talks about and other economists that are from the non-traditional sort of mainstream accepted theories, they say, well, if that is the only way that governments can pay down their debt, the only way they can do it is increasing taxes or issuing more bonds and going into debt. But that is always taking money out of the economy. So if you think about this economy as a, a beach ball that's filling up with air, if you're going to get people to pay more tax or you're trying to get them to pay down debt, where can the money come from? Well, it's only a certain amount of dollars in circulation. So all these businesses that have bank loans, um, companies that have issued debt, they've got to pay dividends to you know, or um, the the revenue shares to sh shareholders through markets. They've got to do that from money that comes from somewhere. So if they're all trying to pay down that debt that the banks have on their books, you're shrinking the economy. Now, the exception here is the velocity of money that we spoke about at the start. So if everyone has a business and they're all buying off each other, maybe the same dollar can be used five times and they can all pay down their debt. But at the moment, that's the big problem that central banks are facing. They can't get any inflation or velocity of money 
to pick up because it's just not circulating. And with record debt, people are trying to pay down their debt rather than go out and spend things. So the Fed have basically got two tools. We already spoke about the money printing where they encourage the government to spend more because even though they think about it as a negative that they're going into more debt, the economy thinks about it as a positive because there's money that's coming in. And whenever the Fed print money, well, they're just printing it out of thin air. And the government these days, as well as the big banks, they've now got bank accounts per se with the Fed. So the government might issue a bond and they get these credits on their account, you can think of it as. So now they've got a lot of money, which is what the US government currently has. They've got nearly a trillion dollars in the Treasury General account, which is just their bank account they've got with the Fed, whereas they used to have uh, accounts with the retail banking system back in the day. Now, the big banks have got this as well. So the Fed will come in at the moment and they're printing money. They're talking about all these fancy new operations they're doing where they're coming to buy things off the books of the banks. So they're printing all this extra money. The problem lies though that the government, or so the banks, they have all this extra money on their books. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to loan it or it's going to get into the real economy. This is where I really want to you know, get you to concentrate because it's the biggest problem that central banks around the world are facing. The banks have this newly printed money. So you might hear things like there's $3 trillion being printed, but that hasn't necessarily got into the real economy at the moment. And it requires average Joe, these citizens to come in and start a business or get a loan do they really want a bigger mortgage to go into more debt when they're worried about their job and the economy? So the problem is that not only that, the banks have all these extra reserves, which they kind of like at the moment, because even though the Fed and central banks have said, don't worry about your fractional reserve ratios, we actually don't even want to require you to have any ratios at the moment. Just just lend out, and if you ever need more money, you know, we'll print it. If everyone comes in and has a bank run, We know that banks have fractional reserves, so they wouldn't ever be able to pay everyone out. Well, they're saying, don't worry. If that happens, we will just print more money for you. Don't worry about your reserve ratio. So despite all that, small business, mortgages, there's just not an appetite there. So when banks say, well, where can I invest? They're actually leaning towards these riskier markets because they know the Fed have basically got their back. So not only rather than getting a, say, 3% on a mortgage, they can say, well, let's speculate in the stock market. It's going up more than 3%. There's a lot of companies with shares that are going up more than 3% or pay a 3% dividend. There's a lot of these companies that are issuing corporate bonds that are paying 4 5 6%, the junk bonds that we talk about on the channel. So there's a big appetite there from either the banks that are allowed to speculate these days, so the same money that's meant to be for you know the household's savings and backing the mortgages and the business loans, those funds are being used to speculate. And this is where we talk about breaking up the big banks. So there's a lot of appetite from the pension funds to use the markets, borrow loans off banks, leverage up. They might be lending to some of these other businesses as long as they're going to issue them some more shares or some more junk bonds. They're always looking of how can I make a return and more money. And this is where the appetite is coming from. And it's ending up in the financial world. That's really important to understand. So these private companies have almost got a money printer themselves because they can always print more shares. And if there's a market there, and there's a lot of money that's seeking investments, they've almost got their own little money printer. You can think of that as. Now the government, this is where I think things are changing. Modern monetary theory is sort of one angle that explains this, but the government is starting to say, why do we need the Fed? Why do we need the banks or the market to buy these bonds off us? All that we're doing is printing them out of thin air. They're then printing money out of thin air and they're crediting our account, but who do we ever have to pay this money back to? We only really have to pay it back to the Fed or ourselves. It's not really a problem. Why do we need that step? Why can't we just spend that money into the economy? The only thing we have to be careful of is inflation, the same as the Fed. They don't want to print too much money because it can lead to inflation. And people say, well, politicians are always going to spend more and promise more, and that's kind of true. 
But I think that this is where we're heading towards. And recently, for example, governments have spent a lot of money, but the Fed have stopped buying the bonds. So you've heard things like the the big deficits, the unfunded liabilities is another thing where they've promised all this to the market and they've got their government expenditures on their books, but they've they've spent the money without issuing the bonds. So they're running up a lot of, of debt. And you hear things like they've had a trillion dollar deficit in the first few months of the year. Maybe it's going to be a three or four trillion dollar deficit in just one year alone. And this is where the markets are starting to get a little bit nervous and we've seen the US dollar weaken a little bit. Now, the other theory that we always talk about is the rest of the world having this reserve currency and there's a huge need for dollars because all these banks are now dealing in US dollars or other central banks, other banks from around the world are going through the markets and to these big US banks because that's a source where they can get US dollars. Uh, and went, now, obviously, that changed recently with the repo markets where these banks weren't willing to lend. So even though they have these reserves and the Fed are saying, come on, we'll, we'll print money and give you reserves, we need you to lend. We don't want the markets to seize up. That's when the Fed stepped in and said, you know what? Rather than just buying bonds off government, which was meant to be all they used to do, now they're starting to buy assets off the books of uh, banks, and now they're allowed to buy things like government bonds, but they're not meant to intervene in the market to the point of buying corporate bonds or stocks or these other products, ETFs. So they've extended the swap lines. You've heard this term to other banks now because they can't get US dollars from the banks. So the central bank are now printing money to give to other central banks, other markets, other governments, other banks. So they're the swap lines. We've been talking about this in particular with our uh, monthly commodity updates with Marin Katusa, where he talks about these overseas companies that are, you know, the mines and they need to get funding, but there's not enough money in the overseas markets or investors. Everyone's a bit nervous at the moment, so we've just got the, the Fed. They're the kind of the ultimate backstop. They're bailing everyone out at the moment. Now, when we go down that spectrum of risk assets, and we have the market crash the other day, so everything is just falling in price. There's no liquidity, the markets are seizing up, people are pulling away their orders and sitting in US dollars. This is where we saw the Fed say, we're gonna start a special purpose vehicle and a raft of programs with funny names, but all that you need to be aware of and understand is that Fed is once again printing money out of thin air, giving it to this special purpose vehicle who's run by their friends, people like BlackRock. So you've got the CEOs, the wealthy people over here that are close to the markets, and they're coming in and buying ETFs, the junk bond ETFs, the corporate bonds. And they've said, you know what? Don't even worry about the ETFs or a broader market of the top tier, we're actually going to just let you buy whatever you want. And the Fed themselves now are saying that they're going to step into the market through these facilities and just buy, buy, buy corporations' bonds. And so at the moment, even though the markets and that, I guess, the volatility and the fear in the markets had subsided, so interest rates had gone back to normal, it was actually very easy for these companies to get funding because now that the markets and the banks were awash with debt, um, awash with funds, they were looking to invest again and people thought coronavirus is behind us, you know, the worst has now passed. So people were really investing and these companies were able to get loans very, very cheaply within the cheapest, I think it was within 0.01% of the cheapest that they've ever been able to get loans and go into more debt. So there was no need for the Fed to then do that, to step in and print more money and start buying these bonds and telling these companies, issue as much debt as you want, we're gonna buy it, the market's gonna be stabilized. And that also has a second order effect where markets are now confident that the Fed's got their back. So the Fed can't lose. They can't go into debt, it doesn't matter. They've always got these money printers. That's why I've got this question mark there. It's the same really for the Fed um, as it is for governments once they realize this that they don't really need to pay down that debt. And that's where I think the conversations are really going. And even banks to some degree these days, they've become too big to fail. So they know that if they ever get in trouble, 
they're going to get bailed out. They're stepping in so early. Look at that intervention. I think the market had been red for a, you know, a week or two and they stepped in printing trillions of dollars, telling the government to spend trillions of dollars and get the economy going. You know, we're not going to let the markets fail. We've got you back. And that's why these big companies as well, basically they know now that, well, as long as they're in the market, they're part of an ETF or, you know, the stock market's being kept buoyant. Not so much private companies, but people are just more and more confident to issue more shares and issue more debt as a general rule of thumb. And this CEO, the, the wealthy, are now getting all their assets boosted in price, so they feel more wealthy. And again, that works in their favor because on paper, they've now got more wealth. So they can go in and get more loans from the banks to buy more properties or buy more shares. And particularly, these CEOs are using that extra money, those extra funds, to issue more shares or to buy more shares back off the market. And again, just pushing up their net wealth. And this is keeping all these guys happy that have all the assets. So this is the wealthy, but that's only a really small segment of the economy. Most of these other people don't have a lot of shares. Or they don't own a lot of property. They're small businesses or even big businesses, but in the real economy, are struggling because people are at home, they're not spending money, we're in lockdown. Whereas this side of the world, the financial side of the world has been flooded with money, but that's not where the jobs are. You know, this is where goods and services are created. This is where we create economic prosperity. So I think that's probably the take home message today about how big the financial economy is that lives in a digital world. It's not real, so to speak. And these derivatives are in the not only billions or trillions, but quadrillions of dollars. And that's actually orders of magnitude bigger than the real economy. So when we see people trying to sell, the wealthy trying to sell all their assets, is it any wonder that there's no liquidity there, that things drop in price? Because with quadrillions in derivatives, you know, there's not that much money in the real world to even take those profits. So that's why the Fed have had to step in, print money, push up prices, they are the buyer of last resort for more and more things. And people are asking, well, are they going to start to buy stocks like we've seen other central banks do? The Swiss National Bank, you know, they own a lot of Apple shares and these other tech stocks. And the, you know, in, in Japan, we've spoken about the government basically issuing all those bonds that are now entirely bought by central banks. They're also buying up the ETFs. Uh, things like mortgage-backed securities, so they start to own a lot of property. I think the next bubble that we have to worry about is the commercial property bubble. So let's just talk about that quickly. In the GFC back in the day, we had banks and funds start to get this appetite for mortgage-backed securities. So how can we create these products where more people have a mortgage, they come into the bank, that mortgage is paying, say, 5%, that's great. That is like a 5% dividend, like a, if a stock paid that out. It's a great yield in a low interest rate environment. So banks love it because whenever they give out a big loan, they get to do the old fractional reserves and it gives them more money and more on their books to go out and lend and to speculate in the financial world. But the funds were saying, you know, we love these products. We can package up all these mortgages into CDOs, so credit um, credit default obligations, collateralized debt obligations, sorry, tongue twister there, collateralized debt obligations. So you have all these different mortgages. They say, let's put a thousand together in this product. Think of it like an ETF of sorts. They pick them from all around the country, from high risk to low risk. And they say, because it's so diversified, that kind of hedges the risk a little bit. But in reality, the truth was we're about to have a nationwide housing downturn in a financial crisis. Now, the central bankers and the leaders were saying, it's never going to happen. We've never seen that before. You know, we've got the good in with the bad. That'll always offset the risk. These guys are loving these products and they're selling them onto their clients. And it was all this big game where the banks were paying bonuses to any employees that could get them more mortgages from average Joes that couldn't afford them. So you've all seen the, the movies like The Big Short. They packaged them up, and once they got to the point where they realized there was a bubble, they started to actually bet against it. So they took out these uh, credit default swaps where they actually bet against the clients who they just sold them to that these things were going to fail and blow up. But because it was so leveraged and 
the market just wasn't pricing it in, once it started to blow up, the leverage, there just wasn't any liquidity there. The reserves quickly get drained. It's like a leverage trade that goes against you in the crypto world or if you've traded futures. You know, it only takes little movements to wipe out your entire account. And that is what we saw in the GFC. Now, more recently, we've seen another example of when products blow up, central banks and everything they've done has suppressed risk-taking behavior. So a lot of people are just continuing to short volatility with futures and ETFs, and they're just betting that things are never going to be volatile again because the Fed's always got our back. A few uh, year or two ago, we saw a lot of volatility ETFs just explode to the upside when we finally had uh, the stock market sell off and volatility return and everyone was leveraged and the ETFs actually blew up and that that hurt some of the, the funds. And you just get an email saying, bad luck, your account's blown up, you've either lost everything or as a trader, if you thought you're on the profit, profitable side of that trade, bad luck as well. There's no one there that's got the money to pay you. So these are other things that have happened in the past and yet here we are again in the same situation with these collateralized loan obligations. So the situation we've got now is public companies issuing debt. The market is just loving these products saying, yes, issue more debt to that um, you know, that oil and gas producer. They take a corporate bond out that's paying 6 7% yield. You stuff all those different products from different companies together and create a collateralized uh, loan obligation. And it's basically the same thing. So now we're starting to see all the oil and gas companies default. They've got way too much debt. The price of oil has gone down. The economy's tanked. That business is not making money. These are all the corporate bonds that are stuffed into the CLOs. And that's why the Fed have had to step in and get this SPV to start buying these off the market because it really is a house of cards once these things start to collapse. It affects everyone. Um, you know, the pension funds aren't going to be able to pay out, the investment funds, people have got their retirement savings, their superannuation. It's all connected, guys. So look, that's where I think the world is currently positioned. You know, I sort of touched on the offshores and the tax dodges and these shell companies as well. But the the point is that the, the wealthy that know how to use these things to their advantage, not only are they taking their wealth offshore and putting into the digital world and these different vehicles, but they've now got this backstop where they know that more money's been printed and they're basically going to keep getting richer and richer. But the money is not getting into the real economy. And this is where the Fed is starting to panic. They're saying, we need to issue a Fed coin, so a central bank digital currency. And we actually want a direct line to every individual, to every business. So once you've got that smartphone or a computer, just like you download a crypto app and can send Bitcoin to anyone, they're going to come out with their own app. Everyone gets their own address. Everyone's got their own account. It bypasses the banks. So even these stimulus checks hand out from the government, they've still got to go to the banks and either deposit it or get that injection. Now, that just all changes once we have people using cryptocurrencies. Now, the government like China want to issue their own. So it's a bit of a battle between who's going to issue these coins, the central bank, the government, or Jamie Dimon and the bank themselves want to issue their own coin. We've also got these private and public companies issuing stable coins. And now we've got the decentralized cryptocurrencies, which I think are the ultimate safe haven where all this money ends up because they're controlled by the people. They allow you, let's pretend that the cryptocurrency world is this blue circle up here. It allows you to interact and do commerce with anyone overseas, anyone in another country in the financial world. You can buy shares and digital assets, all bypassing the banks, the funds, the markets, you know, the wealthy, these companies where the only the wealthy get to buy the shares in the first round offerings. This is just opening up the world through decentralization and anyone with a smartphone, whatever country you're in, can really get involved. They can send money to anyone in the world. They can start to participate in finance. That's why we call it DeFi or open finance. And it just is a game changer altogether. So these guys really do have it easy. 
not only do they basically get unlimited money and they've got a backstop, they know they're always going to get bailed out. They take a clip of all this um, money that flows into the markets or into them. They get to charge the fees, the handling fees. A lot of the time, they're not really doing anything, but it's non-productive for the economy. It doesn't matter if there's a hundred shares or a thousand shares or you issue some more um, derivatives for every ounce of gold. It doesn't matter if we have a hundred times more futures. It doesn't matter how many trusts or shell companies. You know, None of that matters. None of that creates more jobs and economic activity. And this is the big problem where these guys and these guys are realizing that the money is staying on this side of the fence. These guys are getting wealthier and these guys are already in debt and the appetite just is not there from small business or individuals. And the other trend we've seen lately is when they do get that little bit of a bonus or a check, they've now seen that this market is so manipulated and only ever goes up that they're taking that little bit of money they've got and speculating on the markets. Now that's really, really dangerous and I just don't think that that ends well, but that's the problem that central banks and governments and Retail banks are now juggling. So that's banks, debt, and money for you guys. The real world, the financial world, that's been a long one. I hope it's all made sense. If you like these type of videos and you want my daily updates, head over to nuggetsnews.com.au to join our group. Otherwise, smash the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, share these videos around, and I'll talk to you again soon. Cheers.